God promises that His one true church will never die. Learn how the flame of the fourth church era burned brightly despite intense persecution. Next on The Key of David with Gerald Flurry. Greetings, everyone. What was the Church of God like in the Dark Ages into the Middle Ages? Well, the Thyatira era explains that to us and gives us a lot of information on that, and there's a quite a lot of history, secular history, that also helps explain all that. Notice, uh, I'll just paraphrase this, but in Revelation 2, God says that He's going to give power over the nations, plural, to Thyatira in the future, that Thyatira era, the fourth era, really, of God's seven eras from the time of Christ to the Second Coming. And also, God says that He's going to give them the morning star. What is that? What kind of a reward is that, and why is God giving them such a, an amazing reward for their work? Well, the Thyatirans were a bright light in a dark, dark age, one of the most violent, vicious ages ever in man's history. Now, the lamp of Christ was burning brightly because of what they did. And it is very critical to Jesus Christ that His people keep this lamp in this dark world glowing with brilliant light. That is what God wants most of all for His people to do. Now, the Thyatirans, these that were loyal all the way, and uh, at, certainly at the end, are going to be a bright and a shining star in the kingdom of God. That's what they're going to be when Christ returns. They're going to rule over nations, plural, and they're going to be a bright and a shining star, and they're going to receive that morning star. And we'll talk about that more a little later. But how did they do it, and how did they manage to get such a fantastic reward? They did it in the darkest age, perhaps, of our history ever. If you look at Revelation 1 and verse 4, it says, It's to the seven churches. Now, you have to remember that Revelation is a book of prophecy, and it says it's going to show you things that are shortly coming to pass. So this is a, a prophecy for the future, beginning in the first century, of course. And then some of them, of course, uh, six of them have already, already become history. But notice it says, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what do you see? Write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, which was the fourth era, Thyatira, and then Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. All seven churches, and those last two, are in the last days, or the latter days. And you can prove that by numerous scriptures in your Bible. So, God said, Jesus Christ said, that He would build His church, and the gates of hell or death would not uh, uh, prevail against it. It would not prevail against it. In other words, it would never die. So he, he, he said in those seven eras, He was going to make certain that this church, this New Testament church, would never die. You can always find it there, but it would be a little flock. Not a big flock, but a small flock. Now, the church was prepared for Jesus Christ and then started first century, Ephesus was the first era, and then it leads right on down to Laodicea, which is the last era, the era we're living in today. But these things are prophetic. That's why it's in the book of Revelation. It's a book of prophecy. 
not history, but prophecy. And the world, I'll tell you, has just never understood this. They've never understood about these seven church eras from the first century right on down to the very last century and the second coming of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 1 and verse 12, John talks about seven golden lamps. It, should be, it says candlesticks. It should be lamps. These are golden lamps that God, where, it, it, where God's message is. It's, it's pure gold, if you understand about this, spiritually, physically, and every other way. And spiritual light emanates from every single era. Now, they had some bad times as well, but they also did some works that were just utterly uh, exemplary for all of us. And it says in verse 12 that Jesus Christ is in the midst of all seven lamps. He's right in the middle of them. The power of Christ right in the middle of those eras, right on down from the first century to the last. And can we perceive when Jesus Christ is in the midst of a, a small little church era with all of His power, if they are looking to Him? All kinds of power. John said when he, he just saw this in a vision, saw Jesus Christ in a vision, he fell over as dead. Well, this is something that's impressive. But how many people are really impressed by this? How many people really care? If, if Christ was in the midst of them, that means He was deeply involved in them. Herbert Armstrong had this to say in his booklet on the key of the book of Revelation, The second and third chapters contain the messages to the seven churches. These represent the church in its seven successive stages through the age. Yes, and you can prove that. We prove it from our book, The True History of the True Church. But I'll focus on the Thyatira era today and just title it, the flame of Thyatira. They had a flame, and Christ talked about that in Revelation 2, verses 18 and 19. Let me read that to you. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things, says the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are fine brass. I know your works and charity. That's agape, which means God's love, God's love, not man's. And love and service and faith and your patience and your works and the last to be more than the first. Remember that. The last is going to be more than first at what they did it in the first or in the beginning. Now, this was uh, on into 1000 A.D., or it goes on into that, but uh, this was also at the time of the coronation of Charlemagne in 800 A.D., one of the most significant events in uh, our New Testament time, history and prophecy. It leads right on into uh, from the Dark Ages into the Middle Ages. But it began the Thyatira Church began in the dark ages, the dark ages that are so absolutely horrifying when you look at how they treated God's people in God's era. Here is what J. A. Wiley wrote in his book, History of the Waldensians, Behind the Rampart of Mountains, that is, the Alpine Europe, which Providence, foreseeing the approach of evil days, would almost seem to have reared on purpose. Did the remnant of the early apostolic church of Italy kindle their lamp? And here did that lamp continue to burn all through the long night which descended on the true church. Their traditions invariably point to an unbroken descent 
from the earliest times as regards their religious beliefs. And that's about the really the first three eras of God's Church, and beginning into getting into the Dark Ages. After that, Peter de Bruges was beaten brutally because he uh, some certain things he did to pagan symbols. They actually uh, killed him, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he was burned to death. Then uh, after that, he had a disciple, Henry, who took charge of the work after he was uh, dead, and uh, and he was cast into prison once, and they, they finally let him out, and then later they put him back in prison again, and there he died. Now this is how brutally they were treating God's Church, especially in that Roman Empire. It was horribly evil in many ways. So after Henry's death, well, the, everything seemed to fall into a decline, and God's Church just didn't seem like it was going any place. It was diminished greatly, and yet uh, it was uh, something very important was about to happen. Remember in Revelation 2 and verse 19, I, I read to you that the last to be more than the first. So it's going to be greater at the end in the Thyatira era. Let me uh, just talk to you a minute or two about Peter Waldo and uh, what happened to him. Here's a, just a short quote I'll give you. Some twelve to fifteen years before he began preaching, Peter Waldo witnessed the sudden death of a friend. And it goes on to say, well, he, he had actually come into contact with God's Church, but it didn't have an impact on him yet. But his, his close friend just died suddenly, and it really moved him, and he, 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 he was moved, and here he was, a wealthy businessman, had incredible wealth. And he decided that he was going to just give that wealth to the poor. And he did save enough of it for his wife and, uh, and also to translate the language of the Bible to, for people, so they could just have a Bible they could read. They didn't even have, most of them didn't even have a Bible. They were very scarce, and it was even dangerous to carry one. Imagine that, just dangerous to even carry a Bible with you. And many people died because they obeyed what was in that book. They obeyed it. Now, so, of course, his wife and two daughters were just thought he was losing his mind when he wanted to give all of his wealth away, but he did never, nevertheless do just that, or at least most of it. And uh, he was a very great businessman, and he was intelligent, and he knew how to organize and how to, how to deliver messages and things like that. And he had co-workers along at that time, that uh, numerous co-workers that just gave up their lives and their property to God's Church to get the gospel to the world. Now that's quite a light, <laughs> spiritually, when people are so dedicated like that. Now that's being rich in the right kind of uh, way, certainly. Now Waldo and his followers finally were driven out of Lyons in southern France, where they were doing a great work, and that not long after that, that whole area was just totally destroyed because of their work there. But then Waldo went over the Alps to Italy and started a work there, a great work, really. And uh, so, so often you will see when God's church is persecuted, they, they even get more interest and response from people. Now, the work grew rapidly, and everything was going so well, he established a college so they could train laborers. Laborers for what? <laughs> to get God's message to the world. It meant everything to them. God told them to do that. 
Declare this gospel to all the world, if you can. And of course, with the power of Christ, you could have done any of that. But these, uh, they didn't do it except in the first era until the very last days, which was in the uh, sixth era, that that was done and still being done today. But they located in the Androgna Valley, which meant the Valley of Light. That was just what the name meant. You think God might have had a hand in putting those people there because they had so much light and they were writing articles and booklets and there was no printing press? And you can imagine the, the labor that had to go into that. I think it took them at least ten months to print a Bible with a lot of people. And today, of course, we have access to the Bibles and the articles and anything we want about God's truth. But do we see and understand that, and are we aware of it? Well, I'm telling you that these, uh, these people wanted to deliver that message not just to get members. They did get some from it. But they wanted to do it as a witness to this world as Christ told them to do. So we do everything we can to get this message to the world. Christ said, Freely you have received, freely give. And the, the uh, Thyatirans realized that, and they gave all their literature away free because of what God said in Matthew 10 and verse 8. Their latter works were greater than the first. Now, there was a real scarcity in the Bibles at, at that time, as you could well imagine. Here's a, something about their emblem or their seal. It says, above one of many variations of Waldensian emblem, redrawn from an old book, note how the candlestick or the lamp representing God's church in the Thyatira era, Revelation 1.20 is uh, associated with the fourth altar. The angel or messenger, there was angels over the church, one for each church. Revelation 1 and verse 20 tells you that. A guardian angel to help them get this light out and to protect them. And you can see that, that uh, emblem. You're seeing a picture of that even now. This emblem with seven stars on it. It had seven stars. The fourth one was was pointing straight up and it, with a great light because it they knew they were in the fourth era of the church into the dark ages and into the middle ages and then you had the first three stars all this light and then you had the last three stars which would be Sardis Philadelphia and Laodicea the one we are in at this time seven stars all kinds of light Notice what it says in, uh, about this church. Around the rim was the Latin motto, quote, A light shines in darkness. God told us in Matthew uh, 5, verses 14 and 16, You are the light of the world, if you have the truth. You are the light of the world. Think about that. A light shines in darkness. Where do you think they might have gotten that? Well, they got it right out of the Bible, and I'll show you that in a moment if I have time. But this is a fascinating emblem, and I hope we can see that that is a part of the history now of God's church. And at the time of Christ, it was all prophecy. So here you have the uh, these Waldensians doing all this work, and the ministers. Most of them could not even marry because they were traveling all around and it was dangerous. And they, they were willing to give their lives to God's work. Then in, they, they also had a uh, small children's uh, elementary school. It says about 1260, the Inquisition found Waldensian schools in 42 parishes in Austria, to give you an idea of the growth of these uh, churches that Waldo was over.
We're getting up into the time of Frederick the Great, who ruled over the Roman Empire at that time, and they would put people to death for, well, being uh, Bible believers and, uh, and, and really applying what you learn from the Bible. But anyhow, the persecution intensified and it was getting worse and worse. A lot of terrible things were happening. And then we come into uh, Revelation 2, verses 20 and 23. It talks about the woman Jezebel, actually a Gentile woman who seduced her husband to worship Baal. And that's in uh, 1 Kings 16, and verse 31. And she martyred the prophets of God. But he's talking about a great false church of Revelation 17. That's what it's all about. So, what, a, what a, uh, an example these people were. And God talks about their, their, the last to be more than the first. And let me uh, read something to you here, repeat it to you again. And I will give him power over the nations. I will give power over the nations to these Thyatirans. And they will rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of the potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received my Father, and I will give him the morning star." Well, what do you know? He's going to be, God is giving them the morning star. Revelation 22 and verse 16 says that's Jesus Christ. They're going to become the bride of Jesus Christ, the morning star that was right in the midst of that Thyatira era, that powerful Christ. And people keep rejecting His Word today, and the whole world is deceived because of it. The morning star, if you know anything about the morning star, it radiates splendor that outshines all the other stars. And the stars have a different splendor in them according to our works, your works, my works. Our star in the future will depend on those works. We have to understand that. A bright light in a dark age, they kept the lamp burning, that wonderful, beautiful lamp. This is their emblem, a light shines in darkness. I'll just give you one scripture where they really must have gotten that uh, emblem or seal. Notice 2 Peter 1 and verse 19. We also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, a light that shines in a dark place. The seal of the walled engines was a light shines in darkness. Same thing that Peter said. Of course they got it right out of the Bible. This wonderful light shined. And then until the day dawn, and that's when the world tomorrow comes, and then the day star rises in your hearts. In other words, you're going to rise up and meet Christ, and all of this is going to rise in your heart. You're going to have it in your mind and your heart, and you're going to think, and you're going to act like Jesus Christ Himself, and you're going to become His bride. How could we become His bride and not be a great spirit being ourselves? If we live like these Waldo followers at the time. He was a great leader in God's church. But here, he, he's, they're big, all of them are being given the bright and the morning star. What a, what a flame Thyatira did light spiritually, and how they did reach out to this world with great light in the, one of the darkest ages ever in our history. Until next week, this is Gerald Flurry. Goodbye, friends. Request the Epistles of Peter, A Living Hope, to learn about the hope-filled attitude that kept the flame of Thyatira burning. Also request the true history of God's true church, mystery of the church, and a transcript of this television program. All our literature is available free of charge, at no cost or obligation to you. Order now. The preceding program was a paid presentation of The Key of David, brought to you by the Philadelphia Church of God.